Good morning. Thank you for joining in with us. The title of the message this morning is Wrong Use of Your Riches. You know, we live in one of the richest countries in the world, amen. We are so blessed in this country. I know a lot of people wouldn't consider themselves rich. A lot of people struggling financially and has a lot of problems. But when you compare our country to a lot of most other places, we'll have to all agree that we're, we're absolutely blessed. We're absolutely rich, amen. amen. You know, God has blessed me and my family. Our community's blessing this church. He's blessing you. And uh, there's people that don't know where their next bite's going to come from. They don't have shoes for their feet. They don't have clothes to wear. They don't have the freedom that we have, the freedom to come and to worship. They don't have freedom to live as they want to and to be who they want to be and to believe what they want to be. We are truly rich in so many different ways. If you would, turn your Bible to the book of James. James chapter 5, we're going to look at six verses, one through six this morning. And don't shoot the messenger. Uh, this message hits close to home for all of us. Uh, it's what give me, what God give me, so it's what you're going to get. And it also... Uh, speaks to me. So James chapter 5, begin with verse 1. It says in this verse, verse 1, Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have reaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire the labors who have reaped down your fields, which, if, which is of you kept back by fraud, Christ. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabatha, that means a host of heaven. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. You know, there's been people throughout times that is truly rich and famous and riches has taken many people away from God. Amen. People choose to live their whole life focusing on their bank account, on their investments, how they can gain another dollar, how another dollar can be made. They spend their whole lifetime gaining and looking, investing in anything and everything they can to gain wealth. There's many people, millionaires and billionaires throughout the world that they keep gaining and gaining more, more money, more power, more strength, and their riches are corrupted. How sad it is, without Christ, you're broke. Without Christ, you're a pauper. You have nothing. Riches have led many away from God since the beginning of time. This is not new. Solomon and Judas are two examples Judas Iscariot was a treasurer. He was all about money, wasn't he? Even though he was a hand-picked apostle, he sold out Jesus, his Messiah, for 30 pieces of silver. His Messiah. He walked with him. He ate with him. He uh, spent all that time with him, and yet he sold him out. Matthew 26, 14 says, The one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went into the chief priest and said unto them, What? Will you give me, and I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. How sad that was. Satan took a boat in him. Solomon, known for wisdom, yet his downfall was riches. Ecclesiastes says, Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. You can have it all. You can have all the riches. You can have all the belongings, all the material things that you can collect or be given you. And when you give your last breath, you will not take any one of them with you. Amen. You are not going to take no riches with you. If you've noticed, caskets don't have pockets. The, uh, there's no trunks to take it with you. 
All the riches of this life is going to fade away. It's not going to do anybody any good. You know, it's sad that there's so many people in our, in our country, and people we know, no, they may not have millions of dollars. No, they may not have hundreds of thousands of dollars, but they got all that they need. God has blessed them with more than enough. Amen? And they don't look up. They don't give God the time of day. They're not a bit interested in eternity. They're not interested where their eternity is going to be. They're not a bit interested. They don't see themselves as lost. They don't see themselves as undone. They live day by day looking for different material things. They live from payday to payday. They're looking for happiness. They're looking for fun. They're looking for all kinds of things. And that's what they live for, a false hope that Satan gives them. Amen? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. This is one of the very often misquoted verses. Money is not the root of evil. It's not. You can have money. You can have all kinds of money and wealth. There's nothing wrong with money. It's the love of money. It's the love of it. When you have a hunger and a desire for it and it takes you over. The love of it. Money, material wealth, riches leads many away from God. Many from being in the service, in his service, in his house of fellowship. I know how hard it is. I've, I've got a good job. I've made good money. A lot of overtime, out of town trips with better pay. Am I going to go do that or am I going to miss that to be in the house of God? Am I going to do that or am I going to be at church? you got to make choices all the time, amen? When overtime's available and opportunity's there, you say you got to get it when you can get it. We all know what that's about. Let me ask you this. When is enough enough? When is enough? God spoke to that to me a few years ago, and he said, Jed, have you wins enough, enough, son? How much more do you need? What do you need? When will you be satisfied? I've blessed you, I'm blessing you, I'm blessing you, I'm blessing you. Look what you've already got, and yet you want more. And yet you won't look up and thank me for it. You give yourself credit for what you got. Oh, look at what I can do. They couldn't make it without me. Many people has that attitude. Oh, my company has to have me. Let me tell you something. You ain't nothing but a number. You fall off today and they'll replace you with somebody else. They'll never know what your name was. They don't care nothing about you. You're a number. Money, nor being wealthy or having material things in itself is not bad, but it is when it comes between you and your creator. Amen. It's the love when it becomes more important than knowing God. It's more important than doing what God would like for you to do. It's sad, but how easy it is that Satan will use riches. He'll, he'll give you false hopes of, of things that you've always dreamed of. He'll, he'll bait you. He'll entice you. It's kind of like the, throwing a... Uh, a wild animal you throw, try to bait them and get them up close to you. Just give them a piece and make it a little shorter and just bait you in. Satan wants people to be baited in to material things in this life. Material possessions of any fashion. How many of us have said, you know, if I had that, that would be cool. If I had one of them, that would really be fun. Maybe it's a bass boat. Maybe it's a ski boat. Maybe it's a UTV, an ATV. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's a Jeep. Maybe it's a whatever. There's all kinds of things. Campers. There's all kinds of material things. I'm not saying those things are wrong. It's not wrong to have things. I'm not saying that. But it is when it takes you away from God. It is. How many times, and I know I have, I've went out and I can get that. I've got good credit. I can sign online. They'd be glad for me to connect the dots with my name. Because they know I'm going to make a payment and a payment and a payment and a payment. And they're going to make money off my payments with interest. So yeah, I can get it. 
But Dan Old Jay's a slave to the lender. I've got to make him payments every month, right? You know what? After you get that thing after two or three weeks, you think, you know, I don't like that thing as good as I thought I would. I'm tired of making these payments. But you know what? I don't ever have time to use it. So it's just sitting there. I bought a boat one time. It rained every day forever after that. <laughs> God was telling me, you don't need the boat. I get that. But you see, Satan entices us with these false hopes. Our happiness and our joy is not going to come in material things. It's not. Keep in mind, Satan knows your desires. He knows your wants. See, we, we think Satan's just stupid. Let me tell you something. Satan is powerful. Satan knows more than what you've given him credit for. And let me tell you this. You and I are no match for him. Don't test him, you'll lose. Only in Christ are we a winner. Amen? John chapter 8, verse 44 says, Ye are of the Father, the devil, and the lust uh, of your Father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, abode not in the truth, because there's no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he's a liar and he's a father of it. That's who Satan is. He's a liar. And he's a loser. If you read the back of the book, he's a loser. And you know what? He wants to take everybody with him that he can. If you're here, you're listening, you don't know Jesus Christ, he's your father. He's your father. You're his child. As a child of God, if you're listening, he is not your father. God the Father is. Through Jesus Christ. But you know what? Satan wants to take you away from him. He wants to strip you of your testimony. He wants to keep you entertained so you won't be about your father's business. Amen? Amen. Satan is the father of the unsaved. Remember this. He tempts, he distracts, and he uses every weapon that he has to keep God's children the saved from being a usable vessel. Keep us from doing what we know we're supposed to do. You know, most of us, if we have a choice of going out and spreading the gospel, going door to door, or going fishing, or going to the beach, or going out joy riding, or whatever, which one will you take? Be honest with yourself. Answer to yourself. Material things soon become more important than your Lord and Savior. You know, when you first get saved, you can't get enough of the Bible. I remember when I first got saved, I was like this. Couldn't, couldn't get enough, couldn't get enough, couldn't get enough. Do you know what happens? Some people they get saved, they get in church, and boy, they're on fire for the Lord. They're everything going on. They're excited. And soon it dwindles down, and it dwindles down, and it dwindles down, and they fade out. Why? Because they pick up the old nature. Satan wants to draw you away from the things of God. Satan can't take your salvation, but he can make you a stumbling block. He chooses to make you a stumbling block, not a stepping stone for others to see God at work in you. Exodus chapter 34 and verse 14 says, For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Listen, God is a jealous God. He is going to be, he's not going to be second place. You're not going to get by with it. I'm not going to get by with it. You keep living like you are a haphazard life. If you are and you're not serious with God, God's going to get serious with you at some point. Amen. I'm afraid that's where this country's at. Our country's turned away. God has blessed this country and blessed this country and blessed this country. And we're spitting in his face. With all the nasty lifestyle, the sin that is going on and been going on and it's picking up speed. Preachers over time have preached and preached and preached and preached and preached the word of God. But it's like throwing seed. It's throwing seed. Throwing the gospel. Throwing the word. Some will fall on good ground. Some falls on stony ground. The fowl eats some of it and takes it away. Some will spring up for a little bit and then it withers. People won't listen. People's not interested in the truth. Amen. 
They don't want to hear it. I want to live my life my way. I don't need your gospel. I'm good. Let me tell you something. There's nothing good in any one of us. Amen. God isn't going to put up. He's not going to put up with what's going on. The same thing that's going on now was going on in Noah's day. Same thing going on now was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you think he's going to turn his back on it? Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek it first. And his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Listen, child of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Put that first. Put him first. And God will give you whatever you need. He'll take care of you. He'll bless you. Because he honors faithfulness. Did I say he's going to line your bank account with a million dollars? No, I did not say that. Don't get that impression. But God will bless you for your faithfulness. He'll take care of you. You'll have a joy unspeakable. It's a joy that God gives that the world did not give and the world can't take it away from you. Amen? God must be first. Then material things can follow. Turn to Matthew chapter 6 for just a moment. Verse 19. Matthew chapter 6. Verse 19 through 24. We'll look at those for just a moment. Matthew chapter 6, verse 19 says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. The things you do for your Lord, the sacrifices you make for him now will be rewarded for you in heaven. Amen. You know, people today with technology, you can't go anywhere that there's not a bunch of cameras up. Have you noticed that? Why do we put all these cameras up? Because you're scared somebody's going to steal your stuff, right? It don't matter where you go, out in the woods, around a garage, around a building, out in the middle of almost nowhere. We're out with my type work, you're out in all kinds of places. And you look around like, ooh, there's a, there's a camera. You go to do your business, you got to look real hard. I have failed at that. <laughs> There's cameras everywhere because we're afraid the thief's going to get my stuff. We're afraid a hunter's going to be in on my hunting ground. We're afraid somebody's going to get in my work shed. So people is protecting their stuff we're laying up treasures collecting all we can have and it says there lay it up in heaven where you don't have to worry about it being stolen neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal the things you do for your lord your sacrifices yes serving your lord cost you doesn't it it costs you your time. You have to lay down some of your wants. It becomes a little inconvenient. But you're sending on an investment into your eternity. You're investing into your eternal account. Verse 21 says, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know, I've got an old car out there in my building I've had since 1984. And I got that thing in 1984. It's a 1972 Chevy Big Box Monte Carlo. And I've been fixing it up for 10 years and I ain't touched it yet. But let me tell you this, I might get on it next, next year. I've been saying it for a long time. But what am I saying? When I got that car, it looked like you could dip your finger in the paint on it. It looked wet. It was, it was straight. It looked like a shiny penny and I was proud of it. It was my cat around car yeah that's right it's going out every friday and it was clean and when it went out saturday it was just as clean 
and it went out on Sunday too. It was just as clean. Why? Because I wasn't going to church, my friend. That was my God. Yeah, I, I waited all week to get in that car on Friday night and go cruising. Yeah, I waited all week to go out with that car. It became my God. It became a distraction to life. You think, well, that's stupid. How many of you do the same thing? What's keeping you from being in the will of God? What's keeping you from surrendering your life to the Lord? What is so valuable in your life that you'd want to entertain whatever it is that you're entertaining and miss heaven? It's sad. You know what? After I got saved in 1987, that car just ain't quite what it used to be to me. That's why it's sitting there with a half inch of dust on it and stuff piled on it. I order to sell it. But you know what? That's just an old car. That's just an old car to me. Yeah, if I fix it up, yeah, I'd probably enjoy driving around a little bit, probably hit a deer with it, and that'd be the end of it. But you know what's more important to me is this right here. I'd rather be right here proclaiming God's word than I would be in that car or on, on a boat or in a tree stand. We're on a Harley Davidson. We're in my camper. I love my Lord. He saved me. I was ahead of the hell. I was tinkering with cars when I got saved. My friend got killed in a car that I helped build. Days before he got killed in it, I was racing with the car. I was jamming the gears. Yeah. That close. That close. You see? Treasures on earth are going to perish. They're going to go away. Thank God. God convicted me. And I realized my lost condition. And I surrendered. Little did I know I never thought I'd be doing this. I never thought I'd be in front of a group speaking. I couldn't say suey if a hogs is eating me in school. But you know what? It ain't about me. It's about God. It's about a sovereign God that loves you and you. He loved me, and I don't know why. He looked past my habits, my sin, my dirtiness, my filthiness, my temper, my attitude. I talked to a young man yesterday. Me and him was a mirror image of each other. He just got saved recently, and he's a different person. You're a different person when you get saved. When Christ moves in, the devil has to move out. Amen. Young man told me, he says, when I drank a beer, it wasn't one. That was just the start. He said, I had drank at least 30 after that. He said, but you know what? I got saved. He said, now I don't drink beer. I don't drink one because I don't want nobody to know I used to drink beer. He's on fire for the Lord. He's excited. He's a local boy. And I'll tell you what, the Lord's all the difference, folks. What about your riches this morning? What are you living for? What's most important in your life? If you die today, do you realize you're writing your eulogy every day of your life? What will you be known as? The person that had the car? The person that could drink the most beer? The person that was the laugh of the crowd? The person who was the life of the party? The person that has lots of money? What will you be known for? Or will you be known as a child of God? When your loved ones can say, it's okay, it hurts that he's gone, but I know where he's at. He's in a better place. Listen, without Jesus Christ, you're not going to be in a better place, my friend. Amen. Hell awaits you without Christ. There's a lot of good people in hell right now. That's what's sad. We like to think that everybody that's in hell deserves to be there. 
There's people that lives a better, lived a better life than people in church that's in hell and torment right now. Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Without Christ, you can't go to God's perfect heaven. Let me ask you, brother or sister in Christ, are you living for your Lord? That's between you and God. I do, you need to ask this morning an invitation. God, search me out and what, where's my riches? You know, I've noticed something. I don't have a lot of money. I do better now than I used to. Thank God. Give him the glory for that. But I've come to realize at my age, it ain't that I've got money flying around everywhere because I don't. But I've come to realize my time's become more valuable than anything. Have you ever noticed you ain't got time for anything? Because every breath that I'm breathing in and I breathe out, every breath you're breathing in and you breathe out, when God turns it off, you're done. Are you living your life for him? Let me ask you if you're listening. Have you ever asked Jesus to save you? Have you ever admitted that you're a sinner? Romans 3.23 says, For all sin and come short of the, glor the glory of God. For all. All means all. All includes me. All includes you. For the wages of that sin, a penalty for that sin is death. That's not just a physical death, but it's a spiritual death. You're spiritually dead in trespasses and sin. But the gift of God is eternal life. You can have eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, God's only begotten Son. Romans 5, 8 says, But God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, God looked past my beer drinking, my potty mouth, and my attitude, and all those things, all those dreadful, nasty things that I was. And he seen somebody that he created. He didn't create me to be like that. He didn't create you to be what you've been or what you are in sin. He didn't create you for that. He created you because he loved you. And he wants you to love him, to choose to love him, to choose to be in fellowship with him. But our sin separates us from him. Romans 10, 9 says that if thou wilt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, do you realize Jesus, God's only begotten Son, came here for the sole purpose to die for you on the cross of Calvary to pay your sin debt in full. If you believe that with all your heart and believe that God raised him from the dead, he resurrected, you can be saved. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. You have to believe it with all your heart. It's not knowing about it, but it's believing it with all your heart. And you confess that with your mouth. To who? To God. God, I realize I'm lost. I'm a sinner. And your son Jesus died to pay my sin debt. And you tell me if I believe that, that he rose from the dead the third day. If I believe that with all my heart for myself and I call upon you, you said you'd save me and that's what I want to do. Will you do that this morning? Would you like to? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Listen, that's all there is to it, folks. Don't complicate it. Man has complicated what the gospel. That's right. It don't matter what you've done in the past. You may think, oh, he can't save me. Yes, he can, and yes, he will, and yes, he wants to. Will you allow him to? Will you receive his gift? You have to accept the gift. If this was a gold block, and I'd offered one to each one of you, and it was yours to take, and this is my gift to you, you'd say, oh, yeah, I'd like to have that. Yeah, I'll take your gift, or no, I don't want your gift. God offered his son to you personally as a gift, as a payment for your sin. Will you, will you receive it? Will you say, yeah, I want that. Yes, I want it. I, I want that gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. Acts 4, 12 in closing says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven among men whereby we must be saved. As the pianist comes, let me ask you. There's no other way to get to heaven. There's no other way to be saved. There's no other way to please God. 
there's no way to get to him but through that. What are you putting your riches in? Where is your time? Where is your efforts in this life? What are you spending on? Are you wrongly using your blessings? Are you wrongly using your riches? If God's speaking to your heart, rather you're a child of God and you're not living for him the way you're supposed to, or you're listening and you've never been saved, is what you're trusting in worth it? It's up to you. But let me say this in closing. If God is speaking to you, if you feel troubled in your heart and spirit right now, I'm not apologizing for it. I can just tell you this. I don't know which one of you are saved or unsaved. I have no way of knowing. It's not my business. For you brothers and sisters in Christ, I do not follow you around. I don't know what you do during the week. The only thing I can tell you is when I'm here, I can tell when you're not here. I can tell that. But you know what? That's not on me. That's on you. Okay? Yes, you should be here, and everybody that's not here should be here this morning, and they're not. But that's not on you either, no, is it? It's up to you how faithful you're going to be. It's up to you. You're going to stand before God and give account every time you're not here. You're going to stand and give account for every time you could have volunteered you did not. You're going to stand before God and, and give him a, a reason and nothing but an excuse of why you didn't do what he was wanting you to do. That's between you and him. But let me say this. Old Jay's going to stand and do the same thing, okay? We're built out of the same mud. We make, I'm a sinner just like you are. I'm a hypocrite just like you are. But I know Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I can claim that for me. I can't claim it for you. Yes, Lord, I'm sorry when I fail you. What will God have you do this morning? It's on you. It's between you and him now. It's up to you. Till next time, goodbye and God bless.